Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Presented by Spitfire Audio. I'm Kenny Holmes. He's Robert Kraft. We've got a great show today. That's true. And we are proud to be presented by Spitfire Audio. This is Score, the podcast. Our guest today, Chris Leonard. Such a great and talented human being, Chris is. He's the master of the action comedy. He really is, and he's a huge talent, a humble and huge talent. My favorite combination. But he's not just the action comedy guy. I mean, he's got this huge hit show, Lost in Space, on Netflix, and um, he's done all kinds of things. Plus... He's a, an aspiring songwriter, or I guess a songwriter now after Ugly Dolls and right. some other things. So he's got a lot going for him. Excited to have Chris on the show today. And maybe we'll get him to tell us a little about working with Seth Rogen. Yeah. Oh, that, that should be fun. Yeah, well, he's done a few. He's done Sausage Party and then the new show coming out uh, in just a couple of weeks on Amazon called The Boys, which I'm excited to hear more about. Yep. Uh, before we get to all of that good stuff, though, we want to tell you a little bit about our presenting partner, Spitfire Audio. If you're a composer listening right now, you probably already know about Spitfire. Um, they are <laughs> Spitfire makes sample libraries for the world's leading film composers, including many of our guests and previous guests on the show. Um, and the cool thing about the sounds that they provide, they're recorded right at one of the most famous scoring stages in the world yeah air studios which um is in the lindhurst church bought by george martin it's a beautiful room they record all their their sounds there they hans zimmer has helped them out they even have a deal which is very interesting with bernard herman's estate Mm -hmm. bernard herman is the composer of all the hitchcock films i wonder if they got that violin from psycho We'll have to. Yeah, uh, have, yeah, man. We'll have to find out if that's in the Bernard Herman estate. I'm sure Spitfire has incredible sounds. They have uh, tons of different sounds. Imagine having a 109 piece orchestra right at your fingertips. That's what you get with the best selling Albion One library, which is kind of their starting point if you're uh, new to Spitfire products. But they have a bunch of different sound libraries on their website, SpitfireAudio.com. And for a limited time only, for our listeners, you can save one third of the price by using the promo code SCORE in your cart. I don't think this deal goes forever, though. It probably doesn't. Like, if you check on the website in about 20 years and you're re listening to these fabulous episodes, it may not be there. So, get to it now. Go to spitfireaudio.com and use the promo code SCORE and save how much, Robert? I think you're going to save about a third. I'm going to say 33.3%. That's my calculation. Woohoo! Chris Beck thinks so. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, go check that out. And then uh, after today's show, stick around because we're going to play you a little example of how Spitfire can elevate your sound. How Love about that. that. Yeah, it's so cool. When do we uh, talk about what's coming up this week? That's what I'm interested in. It's got, we're right in the middle of the summer. I think you should take it away. Should I take it away? Right in the middle of the summer where lots of news in the scoring world. I think one of the biggest pieces of news is Dan Romer. The most interesting choice, truly, to score the new James Bond film. And I say interesting because I know Dan and I had a chance to work with him on Beasts of the Southern Wild. And what an interesting call. Makes the movie suddenly really, really interesting. Yeah. Can't wait to see what Dan does. Well, last, we, last season we did our James Bond draft to see who would score the film. And nobody picked Dan Romer, so they definitely fooled us. Did we anybody nobody won any money on that. I think we had millions of dollars in the in the pool. But uh it's yeah. gonna be interesting to hear what Dan has to say and, and also I'm sure we're gonna get him as a guest in the fall. Yeah, we'll get him next season, hopefully, and we can hear about his his double O seven experience. Ah, Bond. Dan Romer. See? I left footage of there. As you say. <laughs> um, so, uh, big weekend for Spider Man. Not surprised. Buck long 85. weekend, yeah. super long weekend, making the Marvel universe just kind of unstoppable between Captain Marvel, Avengers, and now Spider Man. Pretty much cleaning up for the summer. But I had a weekend of 
three musical movies. And it was really interesting for me to see these three. Uh, in this sequence, I saw a variety of films. First, Echo in the Canyon, which is a great documentary about the years in Laurel Canyon where David Crosby and Stephen Stills and Joni Mitchell and the Beach Boys and Frank Zappa all were living within shouting distance of each other. Laying the groundwork of music. Modern folk rock, the birds particularly, in the mid-60s. Um, I came out of Echo in the Canyon and decided to see Yesterday. I also saw Yesterday this and, weekend. And really uh, what comes through between both those films and then kind of case closed on the third film I saw is the strength of great songs. I mean, really interesting Yesterday, the way the Beatles songs, of course, hold up and hold up this kind of magical tale of a kid who's the only person in the world to remember the Beatles. And then I went the next night, I saw Rocket Man. Mm. And um, we went in with not sure what to expect, but very, very inventive. Big points for creativity. And once again, the power of the song. Every Elton John song, you go, how does he write this? How did he write these yeah, songs? I so, haven't seen Rocket Man yet, but I'm I'm trying to figure out when the best time is to watch it. Is it still in the, Did you see it in a theater? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's on a big screen and a full house. That was the most interesting thing of all three of these films, which are not, they're not a Marvel film. Sold out. All of them sold out. Really got the last tickets to all of them. So, Well, it's clear that this particular weekend is a big theater weekend, especially with the heat and people are off for a long weekend. My question to you, though, is where were you when the two big ones struck. If, oh. you, if you don't live here in Southern California and you're listening, we had two pretty large earthquakes, not really centered in Los Angeles, about 100 and something miles away, but um, it gave us all a pretty good shake. It's actually a good question. You couldn't have anticipated the answer. I was about one hour into yesterday at the Arclight Cinemas in Sherman Oaks. You were in the theater? When the whole room just started to roll and everybody jumped up and we just sat there and just kind of rocked. I thought, okay, another earthquake. This I'm movie good. rocks, man. And a lot of people went running for the exit and kind of panicky moment in the theater. And I just sat in my seat and kind of, uh, you know, was hoping they'd sit down because it was a really good scene and I wanted to see what <laughs> happened next. And then after the shaking, nobody remembered the Beatles, and the movie made no oh, sense, that's right? that's perfect. That was our own moment. Suddenly, it was all Rolling Stone songs from there on out. <laughs> that's got, crazy. Um, but it was it was interesting, kind of panicky uh, moment for a lot of people. But I think as a veteran of many earthquakes, for some reason, I thought, yeah, I'm okay with this. Yeah, I didn't really get worried. I, I was in the shower during the first one, so that was a little weird. Um, and then my girlfriend and I spent the weekend in Palm Springs and we were in this hotel with, it was a huge hotel and somehow that whole building was rocking. It's just mind blowing how, how powerful those earthquakes are. Um, but yeah, it was, it was uh, kind of a bizarre weekend and we're all kind of still on edge and people are buying their earthquake kits and oh yeah, what a perfect time to buy your earthquake kit after two of them already happened. That's leave it to human beings to to plan ahead. Well, we have some couple releases coming up this weekend. Um, the really oddly titled and interesting comedy Stuber. Oh yeah, Joe Trapanizzi. Scored by our friend Joe and um, could be interesting. Check that out. There's also uh, the picture The Farewell with Aquafina. I saw a trailer for that before one of the 300 movies I saw this weekend and it looks <laughs> really good. I was very, very interested to see it. looks very sweet. I think Aquafina is going to show herself to be not just a comedian, but also a dramatic actress. Hmm. And also this weekend opening is a movie called Crawl, which has this description, which I just thought was, was worthy of sharing with our listeners. A young woman, while attempting to save her father during a Category 5 hurricane, finds herself trapped in a flooding house and must fight for her life against alligators you know what oh man you gotta love hollywood right <laughs> okay hurricane yeah we got the hurricane we got the is girl. this like the sharknado we team? got the house you know what let's let's chuck some gators in there right on bring the gators
So uh, we're going to have a big weekend coming up and a big show just ahead. Yeah, and we also had the release of the Mulan live action trailer. Great trailer. Which looks which looks really cool. Looks super good. Yep, I thought it was great. And it and has uh, Jet Li in it too, which I was surprised to see on the IMDb. Yeah, and actually Jet Li, um if you see Jet Li on an airplane, do you know that you can land with jet lag and Jet Li? It's kind of a thing that I've always wondered about that uh I just think that our listeners should <laughs> And from there, we're going to move forward into a whole <laughs> new future. Oh, one other thing to note. Michael Abels uh, is scoring Corey Finley's Bad Education, which is something that uh, on our show last week we asked him if he has anything coming up. And he said he couldn't talk about it. But, boy, was he really close to being able to talk about it. Can't wait. I think Abels is going to be such a huge contributor to the next whole period of what a score. cool episode. We got a lot of mentions um, from people loving his breakdown of the Get Out lyrics and just the the way he got into the film music industry, um, which is just another really important example of making sure that your work is online where someone can see it. Because we've heard how many stories now just doing this show and many off mic where somebody was just doing their thing for the love of the game and uh, somebody with uh, decision-making power comes out and, and picks them to do their, their film. Did anybody, I haven't followed the social media as closely, did anybody mention my performance of one of Michael's <laughs> cues from, from us? Because I always thought that would at least get some attention. I could do it if you guys... You know, there was a Twitter outage during the earthquake. <laughs> that that might, have, uh, might have had something to do with it. That's probably when all the comments came in. But, I think um, so. So far, nothing. Let us know, though, if you... Uh, Robert Kraft <laughs> covers the score from us. Acapella. We're at Score the Podcast on Twitter. And let us know if you're using Spitfire. Send us some examples of some of the cool stuff you are uh, using with your Spitfire sounds. Um, we had someone send in a question on Facebook and uh, wanted to see if we can answer that for him. He asked, how come when a soundtrack is released, the cues sound different than they were in the movie? And I'm wondering if you've had direct experience in that. I think there's probably some obvious ones where they wanted to release a whole suite and make it a little more of a listenable experience as opposed to it being edited with the film. People don't realize the soundtrack release the purely audio release is a substantially different product than what you hear in the theater where it's there to accompany picture, serve the picture. There'll be different mixes for a scene that was full of helicopter sounds or machine guns. You're going to duck some stuff. But the composer gets an opportunity on the soundtrack release to restore the full cue, do a mix that he likes. And uh, so the soundtrack is really... The music as originally recorded and conceived by the composer, but once that music is handed over to a director and a music editor, it changes for the film. So you get two different products, um, and somebody's listening very closely if they can really determine the difference between the version they heard in the theater and the version they hear on a playlist. So that's hats off to our listener for asking the question. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. We have some... Pretty dedicated yeah. score fan listeners, and uh, I just want to pull up the name of that. That was Ryan Woodhall. Ryan Woodhall, excellent question. Keep them coming. Uh, and thanks for listening. And Ryan. if I don't know the answer, you can be certain I will make it up. This has so, been Ask Professor Kraft. Thank you so much. I like that. Uh, much more to come after the break. We're sitting down with Chris Lennertz. We're heading over to Sonic... Fuel. Fuel Studios. Stick around. We'll right be on. right back. Hey, score fans. It's Robert Kraft. We're back to the show in 25 seconds. If you like what you're hearing, do us a quick favor. Rate and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. It just takes a second and it helps the show grow. Hey, thanks. We're going back to the show right now. Welcome back to Score the Podcast, presented by Spitfire Audio. We are here inside Sonic Fuel Studios today with our guest, Chris Leonard. Chris, thanks for coming on today. Thank you. 
Wow, the audience is huge. I don't know how we get them in here. It is a bit. Well, I can it keeps understand. growing. Thank First you. of all, Sonic Fuel. Can we have a little round of applause just for how beautiful this room is? This is worth. They listen to him. Worth the trip. You know, the, in episode one, it was just. It was one. That's right. It's it was growing. Like the, it was like the slow, cut, slow <laughs> clap from Rudy. That's yeah. right. It's a uh, expanding audience, but the, your studio is wonderful. Thank you. I love it. And uh, very cool. Excited. And it reminds Beautiful space. me, certainly, of watching the progression of studios and spaces that we've met in, which is just wonderful to see. And to see that you now have this great room, Sonic Fuel. Um, just amazing and amazing gear also cool stuff and you've been very busy incredibly so a lot of stuff going yes. on um since we i mean it's been a few years since we spoke we when we interviewed you for uh, score the film music documentary but um you have since then i mean lost in space you got a new show coming out on amazon yep. called the, the boys. boys exactly the boys we're going to get to that um i'm curious though just you know we like to kind of get into the background and and where people started, um, are are you part of a, a musical family? First off, what is what is Leonard's? I've never seen that last name before. Oddly, it's German, which I'm actually very uh, very small portion German. My mom's 100 percent Sicilian, so her side is Teresi. So I uh, a lot of my uh, like both my eating habits and my uh, cooking habits all come from from uh, from Sicily. Um, and then my dad's a mutt and mostly Hungarian and French. Um, and Czech with a little bit of German, but somehow the German You're last European. Name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have a continental sensibility. Yes, exactly. Um, how nice Sicily. I'd like to go. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, but when's I, the pizza? Are we... After the show. Oh, good. So, okay. I yeah. was thinking that you were going to go back to um, Chris's beginning. I know that you actually have had an illustrious group of mentors around you. Mm -hmm. I know that... Um, I have. Elmer Bernstein was a part of it. Yeah, he was and my Henry Mancini. I, I met Henry. I wish I could have worked for him, but he was the one who literally made me want to be a composer. I understand. Um, Do you remember absolutely. that? Uh, why that triggered? A absolutely. I think we share that because I had the same. Yeah, absolutely. The, that was. I had always had. And I don't know if you had the same trouble. I I'm very ADD, and I've always loved lots of different kinds of music. So in high school. I was simultaneously in a metal band doing Metallic and Anthrax, um, while at the same time in choir and playing Conrad Birdie in musicals, and then Perfect. playing in the jazz band, trying to figure out what the heck Pat, Pat, Manthe Pat Metheny was doing. Right? Um, did you have two? Guitar? Did you yeah. have two groups of friends in high school? Or? I had like six groups of friends, <laughs> and so it was very strange, <laughs> especially coming from a uh, you know from like a small blue collar sort of. Uh, you know, college town, uh, east in Pennsylvania, which is right next to Allentown. So it's very yes. sort of like a, a Hess department class. store. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it always felt like I had to compartmentalize my tastes. And uh, and even coming, I, I came to USC as a guitar major, and I wanted to to be a, a studio guitar player or, or a touring guitar player. Um, and partially, I I just wasn't a prodigy. I was a decent guitar player when I practiced a lot, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the one of the three people who came in and could just like shred without <laughs> thinking about it. Um, but the frustrating thing for me was the people in the jazz department only liked jazz. And even the people in the classical department, it was like 20th century or that's it. Any, anything tonal, we didn't want to talk about it. And so I had, and it was, it's a funny story, I was sitting in my elective comp class at USC uh, with a teacher uh, who's not with us anymore named Leroy Southers, who was a USC grad. And Dr. Southers' roommate in college when he was at SC was Ralph Grierson. Oh. Probably, you know, one of the best keyboard players who's ever been in Hollywood. Correct. And um, – I should be closer. Okay. No, you're good. And, um, and it, it's funny because he at one point was listening to something I was writing, and he said – now I know it was an insult – but he said – have you ever thought about writing film music? Your music sounds like film music, which of course means it was too tonal and boring to him. But that was my, <laughs> I was very melodic and I, and I sort of loved that because I had grown up, you know, my mom was from Boston. We had grown up every summer going to see John Williams and, oh. at the, you know, at the Pops and all that stuff. So he said, let me, let me set you up with my friend Ralph and see, you know, see if maybe he can show you around. He'd never been on a scoring stage, never been to a studio. And so he 
calls me up one night and says, come meet me tomorrow at the, the old Universal stage, which Lovely. isn't with us anymore. Yep. Um, and when I got there, he gave me a, a little keyboard case and he said, walk in, sit next to me, don't say anything to anyone, and just watch. And I didn't even know what the studio, what the what the You were an session, undergraduate? I, I was an undergrad. I was, I was uh, a sophomore. And so I walked in and I'm sitting on this thing, on, on this uh, stool, and in walks Henry Mancini. Oh, and on a break, wow. yeah, and on a break, you know, he, Ralph introduces me and he says, call me Hank, which I sort of wigged out about. Of course, I, I was well aware of who he was. But the amazing thing about it, and it was funny because it was the Tom and Jerry movie. Perfect. Back then. So it was a cart, it was an animated movie. And in the morning, two cues didn't fly. And he rewrote the cues on the lunch. And it was literally, he took the same musical material and he turned a fugue into a big band chart. And then he took, it was ridiculous, like literally at the piano, just scratching it out and throwing it to a copyist. So within 45 minutes, he had rewritten two cues, totally different styles. And so I'm sitting here watching him command this orchestra and I'm watching, you know, Hannah and Barbara, you know, just jumping up, for, up and down for joy because he had just solved their problem. He had figured it out. And as someone who likes to change their style of music and always like to sort of write something new and, and be able to play in any stylistic sandbox. I just watched a guy in one day jump from, you know, uh, you know, classical fugue to big band to, you know, there was even, uh, I think there was like a, a, a Tarantella or something, you know, all in one day. And so I kind of said, Oh my God, th this is, this is the job I need to do where every day can be a different style. And I literally went the next morning at 9 AM. I was knocking on Buddy Baker's door at <laughs> USC, who's the head of the scoring program. And I was knocking. I said, I'm changing my major. How do I do this? That I, is yeah. fantastic. First of all. That's so cool. Because you, you were dealing story. with that. You had your, your orchestra friends and your rock and roll and, and yep. death metal or whatever, all the different stuff you're listening to. And then you're witnessing a similar type of situation, but on a film scoring stage and, and absolutely. taking and running. It's also that. just a great what are the karmic moment that? for you oh, of absolutely. being... It wasn't just, oh, this is a cool experience. It was sitting next to Ralph Grierson watching Henry Mancini yeah. perform also at the varsity level of what film composers do. I mean, that was, you were in front of the Dalai Lama at that point who was being asked, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Yeah. And he solved it during lunch. Exactly. Do you ever think about if you didn't go into that room? Because that, that seems like it was like your pivotal change. You'd be playing in the Holiday Inn at East, in Easton. I, I might. You'd well, be playing uh, Satin Doll, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, literally, my mom still tells me about when she came and dropped me off at college. She tells me about the nightmares that she used to tell my dad about that she was, you know, she'd wake up and she'd, she'd have these nightmares that I was sitting Indian style on, on, uh, on uh, the Venice boardwalk with a bongo <laughs> and a hat. <laughs> okay. And, you know, and just... You know, that was going to be me as a Playing professional Playing Metallica. Musician. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, first of all, brilliant. And I love the fact that it's Henry Mancini. I don't know why that's so... Because it's a legendary... It could have been any... Ralph could have been playing a date for anybody. Yeah. He could have been playing a morning 10 to 1 for, you know, a, some episodic TV thing. And it was a TV guy. It was Henry Mancini. You went to the source. Yeah. It's brilliant. And, that, and to me, that's very important because I... That was what made it. It wasn't just that it was film music. There's been, I mean, I think there's really, there's a handful of those composers who literally can just jump from style to style and do a bunch of styles well. Not everybody can do that. And that's very much what attracted me was the fact that I would still be able to to do orchestra one day and do something more rock and roll the next day. And, 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 and that, there's really, at that time, he was sort of the legend in that sort of realm of being a chameleon, stylistic chameleon where he did every style really well. He also is pivotal, as we know. I thought you were going to say that it was Henry Mancini because he was pivotal in bringing a contemporary, which is a kind of fancy way of saying he swung. Absolutely. And prior to that, it was European composers doing, you know, when people thought about film music, it was this kind of, 
Erzat's classical music, and here's Mancini going. Right. I mean, that's it. Think of. I mean, it's just and amazing. so you were just. He was so seminal in all of that, and just so cool. Yeah, Hank Mancini. So There's cool. some great, great Mancini stories. So you change your major, and then where's the connection with Elmer Bernstein? So. It's funny because we got very, very lucky, and for a while I thought I was going to be very unlucky. Um, I spent the next year scoring student films without really know what I, knowing what I was doing, but I was doing you know freebie student films and and uh, meeting people in the film school. And when I was a junior, uh, Jerry Goldsmith had been mm. one of the main professors, and he quit and decided he didn't want to teach anymore. He was too busy, wasn't able to teach. Um, so the big news at the end of my junior year was... Uh, we're not going to be able to study with Jerry. And so for a while, we're like, oh, you know, I was, so, I was so looking forward to that. And then I, you know, I got back for the first day of senior year, and they're like, well, we replaced Jerry with Yeah, good Elmer news, Bernstein. bad news, good news. And I just, I couldn't believe, you know, how amazing that was. Good fortune. He was the most lovely, lovely human being, lovely teacher. Um, you know, he would, it was when he was doing um, Age of Innocence, hmm. and he literally would bring in the rough cut with us and go through it, the spotting. Oh, and say, he was here's... working in this. So valuable. That yeah. is so he sweet. Would, he would say, oh, here's what Marty talked, Marty said about this scene. And here's why I think this is important. Were Let's... you walking in, signing NDAs in the beginning of class? Or not, not even. Yeah. Not yeah. Time. Now we would, yeah. What's really interesting is that both composers I hear channeling through you, Henry Mancini and Elmer Bernstein, because mm-hmm. they're both full of wit Fair and much. full of heart. Yeah. And which is a signature Chris Leonard's oh. both c- signature attributes. Strangely enough, the other composer we talked about who you worked for, I wonder if you've done any pictures in what he is known for, which is Basil, was known for, I always knew Basil as big Russian, brass, b- Greek, you yeah. know, huge. Conan. Co- right, Conan. Conan yeah. the Librarian. and uh, That was my favorite. That didn't do so well, though. That was the fourth sequel. It was really quiet. You had to... <laughs> there right. was no music in it. Everything was... <laughs> whispered the Everything dialogue. Was pianissimo. Shh. Every other line was... Shh. <laughs> um, but have you done a picture in that vein of kind of the... Uh, was it Crimson Tide or Hunt uh, for Red October? Hunt for October, yeah, Hunt for and, Red October. and Robocop and all right. that stuff. I, I've done cues in that style for m- movies, but I definitely... Uh, the the two places I, I noticed it most was I've done some video game scores. Uh, oh, one sure. being uh, a movie or a game called Starhawk and Warhawk. It was a series, and that was very very Basil-ish in terms of like low brass and power and lots of odd meters and big metal things smashing. And and that was was very much in, in a Basil style. And then I got to do um, when I did the Marvel series Agent Carter, um, the like fifth or sixth episode was all about how. Um, the Red Room, which is what eventually led to uh, Black Widow, um, that whole thing. And it was all like a Russian spy training thing. So we got to use a Russian choir. Mm. And and absolutely, I was, I was channeling uh, a little Red October. Would you that. do me and our listeners a favor and give a two-sentence thumbnail sketch of, I don't know if Basil Polidorus is as known as he should be to a contemporary audience. Can you tell us two sentences about Basil, not only how you met him, but who he was and what his contribution was. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, I met him uh, at, at USC when we I, we was there for a um, for a seminar, and I knew he was a sailor. And I mentioned that I sailed, and I wanted to, and I basically said, I want to work on your boat. Let me clean your boat for free. <laughs> um, and he remembered that, and then a while after that, he said he needed some help uh, moving a studio, and he talked to Doreen Ringer Ross at BMI, and she introduced the two of us. You know, gave her, gave him my contact info, and I ended up starting by moving boxes, and ending up you know four years later programming on you know Starship Troopers and, and all that stuff. Dude, I've asked, I've, I've helped so many people move, and I've never gotten a job with a composer on Starship after. Troopers. Um, but Basil, um, it was to me, it was very interesting because Basil. I went the year after he passed away. I went to Ubuda in Spain and conducted uh, my own music. But one of the things we did as an encore was I conducted a piece from Conan. Hmm. And 
the thing that I think he did so well that very few people did. In fact, the other person who also did it incredibly well was the next guy I worked for was Michael Kamen as well. And they had such passion, but they also knew scale in which I guess what do I mean by it is in the same piece, he had full choir, full orchestra, double forte, you know, 11, eight, just slamming, slamming, slamming. And then he would take it down to literally a woodwind duet. Hmm. And there would be nothing else going on. And so, and, and, and when you conduct it, you sort of look at the page and you go, where's the rest of it? But that's exactly what it needed. And it was so, so intimate. It was, you know, it's like we did what he did for uh, uh, Blue Lagoon. Also, it was, he, they were, he was both, he was, and, and, and Michael too. They were so good at finding the right scale to make the bigger stuff feel huge and then make the small stuff just That's such a sophisticated and, insight into yeah. composing, which is that silence and, and tininess sometimes speaks volumes. It's also an example of a composer having control of his dynamicals. And I think mm-hmm. dynamicals are yeah. very important. <laughs> and I'm, tell me just a little bit, did we cross paths ever at Cayman's? Because I did a lot with Michael yeah, oh. and was very close. I don't know. We, what I don't years? think we did, unfortunately, until his memorial when, yeah. when we were there. But, um, but I worked for Michael in 99 and 2000 on 101 Dalmatians. Hmm. Um, and that led to my, I was, I started out transcribing and, and doing assistant stuff, also introduced to him by Doreen at BMI. Um, and then ended up, he threw out a couple of orchestrations. And next thing I know, I had orchestrated 13 cues for, for that movie and then did a little bit of work on, I think the next one was Event Horizon. Hmm. Um, but but mostly it was 101 Dalmatians, and that was sort of my first experience as an orchestrator with a full, you know, huge union orchestra at my disposal and that kind of thing. And and that was amazing. And, and the one thing that I would say in a very different way between the two of them, both Basil and Michael had had such a personality that was – all about passion. Now, Michael's was very obviously flamboyant and showy, and it was all about power and 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 sort of dripping uh, romanticism and that hmm. kind of stuff. And Basil was he was the the sailor, he was the pirate, he was the seaman, he was the grunting girth, you know, you know, sweaty. He, he was, <laughs> you know, he was on a you know he was on a on a board next to John Milius talking about you know you know orcs and things like that. And, but it was still very similar because it was so. Both of them are so much about storytelling. Very seldom did they get into things like tonalities and keys and and pitch. Like for me, I I watched the two of them deal with directors on both, you know, for different movies. And it was always about what the story was, what the character was, who was this person, and what were they trying to accomplish. Um, and that was that was really the big eye opener coming out of someone coming from somewhere where I'd studied music at a musical, you know, you kind of go in thinking, Oh, well, you know, it's going to be interesting if I do odd meters and I do that. It doesn't matter at all. <laughs> None of that matters. The only thing that matters is what's in the heart and mind of the character. That's so nice. I mean, I can't remember the last time an audience stood up and cheered that there was an actually a seven, eight phrase in the middle of a cue, you know, yeah, we <laughs> love it. That changed the way you saved the movie. No, you have to tell story, which it took me a while to learn that as well, that narrative, yeah. you're the last writer on the movie. I must say that your story about Mancini doing that change at lunch, I watched Cayman do that on a score that we did together. And it, was one of the most astounding things I'd ever seen because we were working on something together and the producer wanted to change and I panicked. How are we going to do this? We have an orchestra in front of us. We have a, they're taking a 10 and Michael said, I got it. And I'd never seen a composer be that facile. And 10 minutes later, he got on the stand. I think he actually took a phone call during the 10 and talked to somebody (laughs) and said, um, okay, French horns, I want you to tass it 32 and 33 bases. Can you make those quarter notes into eighth notes? And I looked at him saying, how are you doing this? And they played the cue, and the producer said, that's fine. And I thought, this is a skill set. I don't know if I I knew. I could. I don't know if I could ever get there. He was so calm about it, and he so nailed it, and it just was so impressive. Hudson Hawk? It was Hudson Hawk. We were the co-composers. I remember. Which was a very generous thing that Michael gave me because I'd written the theme. And we literally had a moment where Joel Silver, the producer, said, 
I don't like that cue. And I panicked. Because what are we going to do? And Michael was so cool and just changed it on the stand. And actually, the end of that story is I realized at that point I'm probably not a real film composer (laughs) because my idea of writing film music is you go back and you sweat bullets at night and you work on stuff and you play it. And he did it in 10 minutes. I'm out of my depth. Well, it's funny. If if I could just tell one story. At the end of the scoring sessions for Ugly Dolls, which we did in London, we were there, it's about two months ago, we were there at air, and the very last cue of the movie, the producer, we, we read it down, and I knew, and everybody loved the, the temp, and everything was there, and the, we read down, the producer sort of got on the comm and sheepishly was like, I, I know I said we're good with this, but I feel like it's not quite doing everything we need it to do. <clears throat> and we were literally on our second to last day and he felt really bad about it. And so I kind of came in we watched it together, which is what I saw Michael do uh, many times with Dalmatian. And I, and I sat there and I said, you know what? I said, what's it about? And she's like, he's like, it's trepidation that I'm not feeling. And I need to feel like she's not sure nice. that it's going to work out. Okay. And so when I saw that, I said, all right, well, it's the wrong tempo and it changes in all the wrong places. And because right now I'm playing her hope, but that's not the same as her nerves up till a certain point. And so we had Chris Brooks with us. Nice. And, uh, and who had been Michael Kamen's that's right hand. Exactly. And so we actually went in. It was actually the greatest thing. We went in and I said, I need a streamer here. I need a streamer here, a streamer here. Get rid of the click. I don't want any tempo. And I, on lunch, I sketched something out and we did a bunch of stuff free time and the producer was so ner- like he, he said, because he, he was a lovely guy, and he's, he's like, I'm so sorry that I'm doing this. It seems like, <laughs> and I literally said, I'm like, this is my favorite part. Oh. This is my favorite part, is to get this right, because that's what Henry did. Absolutely. And I said, and so you're giving me the opportunity to do what made me love this in the first place, to conduct free time and change it to make it tell the story that you want. It's about the story. That was the, uh, that was, that I'm like, that was a, gift. a wonderful tale and such a tribute to both your skill set and the job of the composer. What you just said, you are doing the job. I can share that I once or twice had experiences where the composer would turn to the director or producer and go, Oh, that's like my favorite cue. And I think, no, 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 no. Don't say that. Don't get married. (laughs) Right. Don't say that. You're supposed to say exactly what you just said, which is, ah, let me. I'll fix it. Let me fix it. Yeah. And let me tell the story better. And it's a very interesting insight into a character. Trepidation is different from hope. Yep. And maybe trepidation leads to hope. Which it did eventually, about 17 seconds later. But this is the, this is the story that you were asked to tell um can we talk a little bit about ugly dolls and how you ended up being a songwriter as well as a composer which i wasn't yeah the whole cast is pop stars it's not actors you wrote some of them are crossovers but yeah no i wrote it they just sang it we i wrote it was me and glenn slater uh who who i had met working with alan menken um and so that's all i'll tie that i've always wanted to write songs I mean, I, I grew up writing songs for rock bands, and, and I was in musicals. I was in Hello, Dolly. I was in, you know, uh, Bye Bye Birdie in Oklahoma. And, mm. and I always wanted to do that. And when I first got out of college, which was early or mid-90s, when the big Disney heyday had resurfaced, um, I had actually self-financed a pitch for an animated musical that I almost sold to Warners uh, until Quest for Camelot came out and bombed, and then they didn't buy it. Oops. But um, But it was all great. But I, I did this thing, and... Uh, it was called Pride of the Amazon, and I wrote four songs and paid for the orchestra and did a whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> Pride of the Amazon, now for sale. Go exactly. ahead. I wish. <laughs> um, but the funny thing was, so I, I had sent this around, and, and, and I was like, okay, well, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, I don't know anybody. I'm not related anyway. <laughs> and so I, I randomly get this call, and this was in the mid-'90s, from Don Soler, who at the time I didn't know. And, uh, and she said, I got the CD on my desk 
Wait, who, who's Don Soler? Don Soler is now the head of music for ABC, who I've Correct. known forever. Yep. Um, was a music supervisor mm-hmm. who worked on a number of films with yeah, me yeah. And, and, and Michael. And, yeah. and, and, sure. And she did Enchanted with Alan. And, and so anyway, so I did this thing. She loved it. I was, at the time, I was with Gorfain Schwartz. And she called Sam and said, who is this guy that writes songs that I've never heard of? So she heard Pride of the Amazon? Yeah. So, so it was worthwhile. Yeah. Well, here's why it was really worthwhile. Nothing ever happened. I never wrote any, I never did any animated musical songwriting for 15 plus years after that. And then four years ago, I get a call from, uh, from my agent, Richard, who says, so I just talked to Dawn and uh, she now, she apparently knows that you want to write musical theater as well. So we've got this television show called Gallivant that Alan Menken is doing all the songs for. It's a musical but he's in New York and he doesn't do TV and he, and they need somebody to co-write with him out here to make sure that the show goes every week because we have to do live orchestra every week. And it's a musical. And it turns out that she still remembers and loves Pride of the Amazon. <laughs> nice. So I, end up getting, I ended up meeting Alan. Like I, we talked and then I met him here you know, weeks later and ended up getting this job. So we did t- uh, 20 episodes, three songs per episode where I not only wrote the underscore with Alan, but also, you know, produced and, and arranged some of the songs and, and lyrics by lyrics by Glenn Slater, by Glenn, who then ended up where, and then, so we did that. Alan and I got along great. We did a bunch of other things, including sausage party together. Nice. Um, hilarious by the way. Hey, yeah. Crazy. That one's definitely not safe for work. Right? <laughs> um, you know, and even that one's leads even crazier to is the boys. Because, yeah. is because I got an email from Seth Rogen in i don't know a year ago or so who said you know your boy who who uh created supernatural which is the tv show i've been doing for now 15 years um he's creating the show for me based on this comic book um and i just talked to him turns out we both want you to do it let's do this thing what do you think nice and so that even led to to that dude what a 20 year investment <clears throat> exactly prior to so the amazon valuable. Was, right yeah, it was like, you know, whatever. I maxed out a bunch of credit so cards. So then and there how goes. does that get to Ugly Dolls? Yeah, so Ugly Dolls, what happened was uh, I had done Bad Moms and Bad Moms Christmas for STX. And, and uh, Jason Markey over there, who's a buddy, um, he, he called and said, you know what? We're doing this animated movie um, with Robert Rodriguez. And we need an opening song. I've got a couple demos. Nothing's working. You want to, I know you want to do musicals. You want to take a crack at it. And so he said, I had just had lunch with with Glenn in New York, and he had mentioned that you guys were friends. And I said, you know, how would you guys like to take a crack at this? So we demoed a song, and they loved it. And then they said, you want to demo two more? Or no, not at that point. They they Robert Rodriguez decided not to direct it because he didn't have time. So they hired Kelly Asbury to direct, who was my director on the Smurfs movie previously, who we get along great. And so Kelly walks in, hears that song and says, this whole thing's got to be musical. We got to make it a musical. And so they said, keep writing. So we wrote two more. And then at that point, they said, all right, you're doing everything. And let's let's make this a full musical. And by the way, we're going to get a bunch of pop stars to be our cast, which they then went and got. We basically wrote out a list and, and we pretty much got all of our first choices. Oh, so w- you picked, you kind of picked the Kelly, cast. Kelly Clarkson was my number one choice for our lead before anything happened. Mm. And I'm not, she wasn't just my choice. She was a lot of people's first choice. Um, and, and Janelle Monet was on my list and you know, it, it just went that direction and, uh, we just got really lucky. And then I got to fly all over the country and, you know, so you've had songs like, cut by, Oh yeah. Oh, Nick Jonas, Nick Jonas, BB Rexa, Charlie XCX, Lizzo. Um, yeah, just Blake Shelton. All of them. That's amazing. What a cool yeah. way that unfolded. It's amazing. It's amazing. All thanks to a demo you did 20 years ago. Yeah. Was exactly. there a... Because Ugly Dolls was a couple months ago. Any of the songs get released as a single from the film? Do you remember? Or did they? No, I remember. Um, they didn't release our, the, the songs from the movie. There was an end credit song that, that Pink wrote. For that Kelly sang that got released and, and did did pretty well. Um, but I think our you know we we started out. I think the first day we dropped, we were number one for a couple of days and and did well. But you know, but they came out great, and it's you know, is, I, it's just so I just nice. want to do more of it. Is yeah. this something you want to get more into now, songwriting, or is oh, that yeah. just a one and done? No, no, I definitely want. I've always wanted to, so I, I definitely want to do that. And I think for me, next is is to do a stage musical for Broadway. That's my. Do you have an idea? 
I have a couple ideas. Is it Pride of the Amazon on stage? No. <laughs> you know what you should do? You should pitch Pride of the Amazon 2 because sequels are really hot right now. Maybe someone will do it. <laughs> they won't a, know. That's right. They don't even know. It. Then they come back and they'll be like, oh one. my God, they're doing a second? We have to get this. How many, how, how many times would I go into that meeting and they'd be like, I loved that first one. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And it never even existed. Pride of the Amazon. So oh, great. my kid has the doll. Oh, it's I great. Love it. I love it. That's so great. I was thinking of the pictures that we worked on together. I was thinking, could any of those be a musical? We did an Alvin. We sure did. Was it number one? Number one. Fabulous. Um, Alvin. Yeah. With Thank you. Ali D. That's right. I believe, I doing Ali. the voices. Yeah. Um, and we did a Dr. Doolittle. We did do a Dr. Doolittle. And also we did, I was looking at all the different pictures that you and I worked on together, and you always, it's funny to hear these other stories, saved the day and i want to say you saved the day not only musically oh. but attitudinally and particularly in one episode which i remember which i don't know if you would but it was on the legendary epic classic marmaduke i do remember marmaduke there nobody is, else does but i do there was a story that i still tell when i teach of how you actually calmed me down with one very sweet look in a Marmaduke session where it's a scene in Marmaduke where there's Marmaduke, and I think Marmaduke uh, is meeting his girlfriend in a park. And I can say with, I guess the most polite way to say it is Marmaduke was not going to win many awards as a motion picture. <laughs> in fact... The very fact that Marmaduke the movie was in focus from top to bottom was something <laughs> you could recommend the movie. Yeah, it's it's in focus. It definitely I used is. to say that. The whole movie's in focus. You know, how's Marmaduke? Mm, Marmaduke. Yeah. yeah, it's Marmadukean. So we get to the moment where Marmaduke and I believe a collie have met in the park. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is where my life has gotten to. I'm now in a very serious executive meeting at Fox, director, producer, head executive of that particular division, and the composer, Chris Leonard, who is the smartest person in the room about a lot of things, including what should happen musically. And we watch the scene, and I think, that's great. I mean, it's fine. Kali and the great Dane have just met. We're all good. And the executive says, you know, I'm... I'm concerned about something. Um, I'm not sure the collie has enough irony. And I remember that. thinking, <laughs> I'm either going to, if, it, if we weren't on the first floor, I would jump out the window, or I wonder what the penalty is for homicide. Because I was so over Marmaduke at that point, because they had made a change on everything. And Chris Leonard said... Can you explain a little bit what you're looking for? Let me see if I can fix that. And I thought, bless you, sir, because I'm about to lose my mind. Well, they probably invested so much in the awards campaign that they were really, they wanted to, to hit. I just remember, and to this day, whenever I teach a class about film music, I say, be prepared. It won't be, you know, I'm, it's funny. Is that a minor seventh? They won't say that. Yeah. They won't say, I'm not sure if this should be a halftime I, I think maybe you want to be on two and four none of those remarks composers they'll say something like does the collie have enough irony and you have to look straight in the face of the studio executive and go let me see if i can fix that and that's why chris leonard's gets hired because he didn't say what i was thinking which is you're out of your mind dude <laughs> But you know what the funny thing was? Tell me. It didn't have enough irony. Oh, God. <laughs> That's a hard Because point. I didn't give it any irony the first time because I didn't think about that. And it wasn't until that very moment where I'm like, oh, I, don't to I didn't know what that meant, which is why I asked the next question. But I certainly know I didn't put irony in it on purpose. And so that's when I was like, oh, shit. Well, if they want irony, I better figure out what they mean by irony, which I would I even think, how do you write musical cues that have that are ironic. That even that's the that irony. impresses me too. That is, that's why thank you, you very get much. the big bucks. Oh, I think we have to ask Alanis Morissette, don't we? Yeah. Oh, oh, nice. But, I wondered if he said it doesn't have enough ironing. 
<laughs> it didn't have that either. Actually. <laughs> it had so zero long. ironing. Yeah. In well, fact, no ironing. That was a big lesson for me in control, in diplomacy, um, because I'll always remember that moment as I kind of lost it. Let's. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we got to get to. You got so much stuff going on. We want to talk about the boys and Lost in Space, and uh, also about how you have kind of become this expert in the dramedy genre. Uh, much more with Chris Leonard's coming up when we return. Hey, Matt Schrader here, director of score of film music documentary. For the latest news from the film music world, follow us on Facebook. Just search "Score a Film Music Documentary," or let us know who you want to hear next on the show on Twitter. At Score the Podcast. Welcome back to Score the Podcast, presented by Spitfire Audio. We are here inside Sonic Fuel Studios, and Chris Leonard's this this whole score is just awesome. Wow, Thank magnificent. You. Thank you. This is Lost in Space on Netflix. And I'm curious about this this show because you know it's a it, they're they're bringing it back, they're modernizing it. Um but they wanted to keep the John Williams sound and as a composer, first off, did you work with John Williams? I'm curious how that all came together where you you got to put your own thing into it, but they also wanted to keep that original sound and married to the show, the, to the concept. I wish I had worked with John on it. Um, he he wasn't involved, but he he did know that we were doing it, and, and we had his blessing. Um, as well as you know, the producers of the show were very very you know serious. They wanted to make sure that we kept elements. There are things that had to be there. There had to be Danger Will Robinson. There had to be you know, um, the robot, there, there were certain things that they wanted to keep and, and definitely the music, uh, in terms of that, especially the theme from season three was one that they wanted to keep. Um, when I got called about the show actually by Zach Estrin, who was another friend of mine from USC, um, who married my next door neighbor, as a matter of fact, back in the, in the day. Um, and he called and, and asked me about doing, we'd never worked together. We always wanted to. And the first thing he said was, so we're rebooting Lost in Space. So pretty much I was already, let's do it. <laughs> but I let him keep talking. And he said, but not only are we rebooting it, we want to keep the John Williams theme involved somehow. But we're not, it's not going to be campy. It's going to be legit. We have, mm. you know, over $100 million in, you know, in special effects. In and your all yeah, and then, I mean, nah, this, nah, not in my feet. this but, show is every episode is a film like this is yeah, high huge. quality stuff. Yeah, I think last year before the latest Game of Thrones, I think it was the highest per episode uh, budget of any show Um, because the special effects are nuts and and everything's crazy. But one of the things he said was, we actually want to make it more like a a 1980s family adventure, like a Zemeckis Spielberg, you know, fun adventure kind of thing. And so at that point, I was like, okay, now I'm really in. So let's do this. Um, and, and we just, we just went right after it. And, you know, I, he gave me, we took two weeks and I said, I'm not going to write any cues. I'm just going to write themes for two weeks. So we definitely, we used the Williams theme. And then I wrote, I think three or four new themes, one for the family, one for the kids, um, one for Dr. Smith. And then we sort of worked those until we were happy with them. And then we got to really, I mean, it, it, be, it really feels like an 80s family adventure. And had the opportunity to record an orchestra. Yeah, we were playing at, it. Yeah, well, we were at Abbey Road. Uh, and we, you know, there's over, believe it or not, uh, there you go. It is a real orchestra. It's a good one. Yeah, they're amazing. Oh. This was at Abbey? Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. And and the crazy thing about it was there's over, I think there was five, a little over 500 minutes of score in the first season. Oh, my God. So, ridiculous. So we weren't able to actually do all of that with orchestra. So we had to sit there. When we spotted episodes, we would say, okay, well, we can have this 
many minutes of live orchestra per show, and we would we would take the biggest cues and assign them as for orchestra, and then we would do other things for the smaller cues, whether it's textural or ambient, and then we would bring in, you know, we had Elizabeth Scott sing on one mm. of them and do some solo vocals. So we would always try to, like, depending on the size of the cue, still make it feel like it was a purposeful, creative decision to go bigger or smaller. Um, but it was an amazing experience, and they, you know, they really – Hook, you know, hook, line, and sinker, but full, fully committed to this idea of this should be a show that the entire family can watch. And there really aren't many of them anymore. And that was the thing that I thought was so fun. And, and Zach, who runs the show, um, who's got a family and kids, and 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 we all said, you know, we just want to be able to sit down and watch together, but have it be something that's really fun for everybody. And that's that's really where we went with it. Um, and I, you know, it, I think it, you know, it, it wasn't quite stranger things but it was one of the top shows last year and they decided to bring it back and and i, I think we're even more exciting this year because I'm, I'm about so great. three quarters of the way through they've committed to this level of music and this kind of music and just overall the quality yeah they really they really and honestly i must say like netflix has been a pure joy to work for i've done i've, I've done another show as well besides that for them and they just they're very filmmaker friendly and they really have once they buy into the concept of the show, they sort of commit to it. And then they, they said, okay, what do we need to make this show what we promise people? Clearly all of it due to the incredible talents of Amy Driscoll Dunning. We know Amy. Who is the head of music at Netflix. Um, what do you think about the, the, the way things are going? I mean, when you got into film scoring, these platforms didn't exist and there was not – not nearly this much content out there and, and work. I mean, it seems like every day there's 25 new shows and everyone's always like, have you seen whatever? And it's like, I don't even have time in the day to even realize how many right. things are out there. But that's putting, that's making work for film composers and filmmakers everywhere. And it's, it's never been more plentiful. Oh, I think it's amazing. I mean, I, I you know, I, I've always said, cause I've done video games, I've done movies, I've done episodic TV network and, and otherwise, and I've always, whenever anyone asks, well, what, what do you like doing the best? And I just, I like doing the best quality projects and telling the stories that I'm inspired by with music and working with collaborators that, that I really love and respect. And I don't really care what it's in. If that, you know, I've, it's I've, so nice. You know, I've had, I've some of my best, you know, my, my best experiences have been all across the board, whether it be you know, movies like we did, which, you know, I mean, Alvin was still literally just the most amazing, mind blowing experience for She's me. She's so impressed that she is with Carol is here and is with the composer of Alvin, which she saw. It's scary to think how young she was. I don't even was. want to think about right. how young you were when you saw that. How, movie. Lo how young were you, Carol? I think I was 11. We looked it up yesterday. At least it's double like... digits. I thought she was going to be single digits. <laughs> Life changing. Boy. But, uh, um, but yeah, it's amazing. So you were talking about Lost in Space and how the whole family can sit around. And then we transition now to Horrible Bosses, where let me just read a couple of this is the track list from Horrible Bosses. Total fing asshole. F -er. Hey, d quad. What the f? <laughs> uh, let's kill this f crazy. B I think we get the point here. You forgot the best one, though. Oh, go ahead. Can you see my? Okay. Oh, so, I, I missed that. That's... And the only reason I had to mention that one is because that actually hangs framed behind Aaron Scully's head at the New Line Music Department. Lovely. <laughs> yes. Which I'll is, look for that. Yeah, she always... So first, I think the question is, who names these and wh where? what inspired this? Because normally, we were talking about this in our in our prep meeting, but normally it's like a line of track in, in the movie. Is is Are these all lines of track? Lines of dialogue. These are all or lines, of, lines dialogue. of dialogue. I mean, are they? They are all lines of dialogue from those scenes that they were in. Oh, Absolutely. Good. So then it's utterly legit because I was explaining. Of course, you look at a. You can't just call a cue. What is the technical term on a cue sheet? Is you know Q four M three. Right. That's boring on a soundtrack album. Of you don't say that. So you say the cue is called "Don't go in there." Right. Because some character says that or. Welcome home, and that's how you get all those cues. Or coke in a dustbuster, you know, whatever. It we, doesn't. Matter. We couldn't figure out if that was somebody's really bad joke, 
of cues. They're yeah. actual lines of dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, this movie, if you haven't seen it, which I haven't, it's hilarious, but it's not for the whole family. No, absolutely And you not. can tell by the soundtrack. Um, with this film and many of the films that you've done, um, you've kind of become the go-to for these dramatic comedies where it's not the campy the audience is told when to laugh, but it's there's an action scene and then you have punchlines and there's there's a real talent to this and it's a hard thing to score, I imagine. But what is it about these types of movies that you're drawn to? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's, a lot of that goes back to Elmer, quite honestly, which is, you know, he was the genius in the 80s who, starting with Animal House and Caddyshack, took, you know, took R-rated comedies and, you know, proved the point over and over and over again that writing funny music does not make the movie funny. <laughs> you know, the reason that Stripes is funny when the RV blasts out of the, the military base is because it might as well be a cue from The Great Escape. Rather, it's not a comedy cue. It's a military cue. And that's what's funny because then when you pan up and you see Bill Murray driving and the music's really serious, that's what makes it funny. And that's really often, like you said, you know, the action scenes, whether it be in, in this or, or something like Ride Along, where it was a very hard-edged, you know, orchestra plus, you know, 90s hip-hop, you know, kind of thing. Hmm. The idea was not to make it funny. The idea was to make it really, really serious, and then right before you cut to Kevin Hart or Charlie Day with a silly look on their face, you stop. And you just set up the joke, and then you stop, or you pause. And then you come back in and then comment on it. And I think that's, you know, it's not necessarily as orchestral necessarily all the time as what, what Elmer was doing, but it's really the same kind of approach of just playing the straight man. It's it really it. It seems like, too, it opens up the door for you to get into your kind of rock background because the Horrible Bosses thing, it's it's really guitar heavy and and kind of band sense as opposed to orchestra. And that that's kind of what, what got you started anyway. A absolutely. And that was... That was the thing that that I started on Horrible Bosses that I now do as a completely selfish gift to myself was that was the first time where the director, Seth Gordon, who was an acquaintance before then and is now a really good friend, he came and when he said, you know what, I really want this to feel like Beck and the Beastie Boys and Black Keys and I want to have it be this really authentic kind of thing. And that was the first time they said, well, you know what, let's do, let me find as many of those people as I can. And let's go to, we went to the village and we recorded to analog and we had, you know, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam playing guitars and we had um, Beck's drummer, Vic, Victor Andrizo playing and we had, and I found Money Mark from the Beastie Boys who played all the key. And I said, come over and he brought his truck full of all his keyboards that he had <laughs> broken and beaten up. And we said, we need to do this the real way. But it was the first time as well, and Hans has already obviously figured this out. It was the first time that I said, wait, I can use this to get opportunities to work with people who are heroes of mine, people who have been in bands that I love, who've written songs that I love. And so now I really do that. You know, I was telling uh, you that, you know, I did the same thing on, on Ride Along 2, and I went out and I, I said, all right, it's in Miami. I need some Latin stuff. I'm calling Sheila E., and I'm calling Arturo Sandoval, and I'm going to bring them in just because I want to work. Uh, first of all, It'll make the music better. But second of all, I, I think that magic of bringing in legit, you know, collaborators is the key. It's something that I learned from Hans and from T-Bone Burnett. Yeah. And I always thought, that's so cool. Yeah, this boys. is all kinds of, yeah, they crossover. They actually make this effort that I thought, you can just, can't you just go to Studio Cats and have them kind of sound like? It's different. And I really try to, almost with every project I do, I try to figure out, well, who can I bring in to make this special, both for the film, but also for for me. And I, you know, that's, See, that's a great. Big and it's not, some composers or artists would say, oh, I can do this with less work than having to scramble to find that drummer and this bass player. But somebody who loves the craft, no pun, all due respect to and Richard. I do. Um, Both crafts. You go. You go and find the cats. Yeah, they're precious. Yeah. See, that's it. <laughs> Better job. Um, let's just before we shuffle on. You just did Shaft. I did, and um, I was really interested to know 
again, not unlike the Lost in Space and John Williams reference. Yeah, how about it? You can't not nod the head to this one. Far out. Ah, I just needed to hire you. Yeah, I could (laughs) have... Did they come to you saying, you remind us of Isaac Hayes? Obviously. um, The voice, too. how How does that come up, and what in any way were the conversations about how referential to the original how original should it be for you um, because you're inheriting not only a film with a precedent but a score with a huge precedent yeah um, well it came to me because he's my director so uh, Tim Story and I have done seven movies together now yep. um, he's the best I adore him he's and, great and he's just the most lovely person um, and so he just said we're doing Shaft next um, and then, you know, we talked about it from the get go and I, I'm such more than a music fan or a, you know, or, or just a, you know, a score fan. I, I'm a, and I, I, I love classics. I love iconics. I love the Godfather. I love star Wars. I love, and there's nothing more disappointing than taking an iconic character and not you you owe the audience mm. that you owe them that theme tim agreed we have to use the isaac theme they had you know, we made sure we had permission to do so um because you know it's like you can't have james bond come out without the james bond theme it has to be there yeah it's part of the character it's part of the character yeah. so i i would never i, I actually don't think I, I would literally go on record saying it's a terrible idea to not have the isaac theme um and then so our big discussion was was where is it and how much does the rest of the score get influenced by it? And and the the movie kind of dictated the the, the rough concept of the movie is that Isaac has – or Isaac – that Shaft has a son um, that he's estranged from. And the son ends up going to MIT and becoming a hacker and doesn't like guns and, and is very, very straight-laced. Um, so he gets hacker music. And he's got something that, that that's very, very modern and uh, sort of modern hip-hop thriller kind of stuff. And then when Shaft's on the screen, it's Shaft's music. It's got to be Shaft's music. And then the interesting thing is as as the son and Shaft get a little closer together, they mingle a little bit more. What's as, that as cue that called? Uh, which one? The the hacker. Uh, the hacker cue is probably the uh, – jeez. Um, I don't know the names of them other than 3F7. <laughs> can but, we say it as opposed to the horrible boss's cues? Can we at least say the title – Yes. To a family audience. Yes, I think you can on this one. Without beeping. Unless it was a Samuel L. Jackson line. Yes, exactly. There might there's a couple that are that are What the I'm not gonna do I that. think there's one that you gotta be out of your goddamn fucking mind. <laughs> nice. And that one that one I think we just X'd it out in the actual words, but you gotta do it with Sam. You have to. Of course. Yeah. How cool. And so I think Shaft is your most recent and the boys is what's next, yes. correct? Yes. Are you working on the boys now? No, boys is done. Done. Boys is done. Uh Yes, it's done, and uh, now on Lost in Space two, season two. Yeah. But boys, I th- can you tell us anything about the boys? Up. It's coming up absolutely in just a couple weeks on Amazon. It is incredibly over the top. It, it, so it, it's the same uh, graphic artist who did Preacher, which Seth and mm-hmm. Evan also do, um, and it is it is. Everything that you expect a graphic, uh, like a very adult graphic novel to be. Um, but the funny thing about it is it's, it's very timely. So it's basically the, the premise is if the Avengers were completely corrupt and horrible people who only did this for their own egos, but nobody knew that. And then there was this team of normal, you know, just really impressive normal people who are basically trying to out them. Mm. And that's the that's the general gist without giving away anything else. Um, and that's that's what's in the the book. All animated? No, it's not. It's no, all it's, it's live all live action. action. And it's all the, live and action. the trailer is out of control. It's out, <laughs> the the show is ridiculous. I mean, there's limbs flying there's off. It's limbs, crazy. There's yeah. It's just very very gritty and incredibly you know at points offensive and bloody and revolting and hilarious. But the funny thing is that after you get past that. There's also this incredibly sweet love story. Mm. There's a, you know, a really hopeful, you know, sort of, you know, dream fulfillment thing going on. 
Um, it's really, it's kind of a little bit of a really fucked up fairy tale. How nice. What it is. I'm curious what it's yeah. like to sit in the room with Seth Rogen and some of these guys. I imagine it's hilarious, but they're also like visionaries. And these guys are churning stuff out. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I've said this so many times since, but when I spotted Sausage Party with Alan and I spotted and sat in the theater and spotted about Sausage Party with, with Seth, I've never heard... So, I mean, I'm not never, but but just such brilliant direction and timing advice <laughs> on drama and character. Like he knew – like there were times where someone would even suggest, oh, well, what about this? You know, as, as this door doesn't open, should you put in a little and, – and he would just be like, no, that's a terrible idea. You don't want funny music there. That's because of X. Wow. And he's really – and then so he came with us to – um to Abby to record Sausage Party. And so he was in, this, in the studio the whole time and – I, again, just one note after another was so smart and so story driven that, you know, when he's like, oh, well, you know, when the hot dog, you know, flies across the room and is doing this thing, it's really like Errol Flynn. <laughs> but you got to remember that he's, you know, he's try in, in his mind, he's saving the world. He's not just trying to, like, get out of the grocery store. The grocery store is the planet. And if he doesn't get out, the planet will fail it needs to be that big and it's that kind of note that makes perfect sense to me. i'm like okay i get it now and and so he's just so smart and just lovely and, and hilarious but but <laughs> really just he knows storytelling and how that relates to music I love very that. very well and it's not surprising when somebody's great that they're really great, that it's not accidental. No. People think, oh, he must be a goofy guy. He's just mm -hmm. funny and silly and lucky and all those things. That outside of working with great artists, you don't know until you're in the room. That is both wonderful to hear and somehow not surprising mm -hmm. that yeah. he's that tuned in to his own work and what he's making. And Well, and he's making all different types of things. I mean, animated stuff and the boys. This This looks like it could be a film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's huge. And and he just I mean, he really is. He's brilliant. And he's he he specifically makes stories and invests his heart in stories that while being edgy or off kilter or or, you know, pushing envelopes, they always at the at the center of them, you know, center of sausage party, there was a save the world aspect and there was a social commentary aspect and there was a love story and a love story and, and the same thing happens with the boys and i think in some ways that summarizes the work of chris leonard's mm -hmm. it's save so. the world it's social commentary and it's romantic and i think that is the kind of comic and dramatic elmer coming through mm -hmm. and hank mancini coming through and for me knowing that you are this busy and involved in film scoring is i told you earlier i've seen it from pretty close to the beginning and it's pretty exciting there's to, a tear coming out of that yeah eye man, and to see all this and see sonic fuel studios ladies and gentlemen how great was it to be with chris lenders can we have a little the audience i know is excited they're just going crazy can we expect uh a bunch of themes in that show by the way the boys or um what what uh what was the 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 idea when you came into the room we didn't really ask about the music yeah yeah um the music is actually very wide range there's superhero music for mm. the heroes which is very manufactured on per it's supposed to be very very corporate and that is very orchestral and then we actually you'll see but we actually use electronics to mess with the final orchestra recordings in a way that you kind of feel something's going awry and that's one thing but then the sound for the boys is completely non-orchestral it is literally a garage band playing the lead character Car uh, carl urban is is british in the show and and so we went with a very garage british punk like recorded poorly <laughs> it was the first time i've gotten to play a lot of my own instruments because I, it was supposed to be kind of bad on purpose. And so it's very <laughs> distorted and, and gritty and, and garagey was the word that, that Eric, the showrunner kept using was like, it should feel like a garage band, but playing action music. And that's kind of where we went with it. Amazing. Very cool. And that show comes out 
the 26th of July 26th. Yes. And is it it's it's all at once or is it weekly? It is all at once. Yeah. It's well, a, it's a you can drop. binge that uh, yeah. during the summer. It's Fantastic. Gonna be July 26th and then Lost in Space 2. That's and right lots before Christmas. Of, yeah. And lots of great things ahead for Chris Leonard. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been great. We know you have a lot of work to do, so we appreciate the time. Uh, we want to remind our listeners to follow us on Twitter at Score the Podcast. Be sure to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And also be sure to stick around at the end of this episode so you can hear an example of how Spitfire Audio can elevate your music if you're an aspiring composer. Yeah, I think if you're a perspiring composer, then you're going to understand how hard it is to get this job done after listening to Chris Leonard's. We're going to be back next week with another fantastic episode of Score. I'm Robert Kraft. Kenny Holmes. And again, we are presented and so happy to be presented by Spitfire Audio. We will see you next week. Chris, thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, guys. Hey, Score fans, we're so excited for the support of Spitfire Audio. They collaborate with people like Hans Zimmer and the Bernard Herrmann Estate to build sample libraries that elevate your music. You're about to hear a musical demo of what that sounds like. And as an exclusive to our fabulous listeners, Spitfire Audio is offering one-third off any product they sell if you use the promo code SCORE. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's me. Just go to SpitfireAudio.com and check out their selection. And remember, this offer is exclusive to Score the Podcast listeners. So take advantage of the deal. It's a limited time offer. Again, one-third off with the promo code SCORE. Here's a quick example of what some of the sounds sound like. You can get amazing sounds like the ones you just heard and many more now for a third off. A third off the price, just make sure to use the promo code SCORE so they know we sent you. We'll see you next week. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. What about strange lands and an escape from the everyday? It's brilliant, George. Before anyone knew them by name. Who's a good boy, Indiana? 400 grand? Let me explain it. George, that's our money. Blockbuster. Everybody, take cover! 
following the spectacular failures sir, sir, are you all right? and the unexpected triumphs. I told you, George. I told you. A six-part immersive audio series. Blockbuster. Experience the entire six-part series ad-free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other platforms.